the, through a discussion between the um, uh, distinguished panelists here, we've decided that uh, we want to talk about the uh, relationship of art fairs to curating. Um, so what makes um, art fairs useful to curators? Uh, Michael, maybe you could start. Sure. Well, I, 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 um, I think I used, when I first started going to art fairs as a curator working for a museum, I hated them. And I think mostly it was because I, I love ex... Yank this closer. Um, I, I was saying that um, when I first started going to art fairs in this capacity as a curator, I, I absolutely hated them because I really, um, you know, felt so strongly about what an exhibition does and how it functions in a gallery or in a museum and, and, and how this, this kind of setting, you know, really dis, dis, disavows that kind of uh, concentration and, and clarity and everything. Um, but over time, I, I've really kind of come to appreciate what, what these fairs can do. I mean, it's amazing, uh, you know, to have all of, you know, people like us, you know, dealers, artists, collectors all in one place and the kind of networking and the dialogue and the discussion that can happen, I think has, I've really come to appreciate a lot. Um, and I'll, especially when, you know, we're trying to do a lot of cultivation of uh, collectors and trustees and talk to them about work and educate them about work. You know, it's just, it's an easy place to do that. I mean, it's sometimes it's not as deep as you'd like to go, but it's, it's, it's a gr really a great place to start. So I've, I've, uh, I've definitely come, come to terms with, uh, with art fairs. I'm sure there's other things to talk about, but that's one, one thing that I think has definitely um, you know, become realization for me. I kind of had the opposite experience, which is that uh, the, my first experience is going to art fairs. It was sort of like, wow, it's, you know, all these things in one place at one time. And it was just very exciting. Like, it was like one-stop shopping. You can just see everything. And, um, you know, because I didn't, as a young curator, I didn't have a big travel budget and I couldn't go to lots of exhibitions in other places. I couldn't, you know, travel overseas um, to, to gallery exhibitions uh, very much. And so to be able to go, uh, you know, to Miami or to New York and, and uh, you know, at least have some contact with galleries from all around the world was really exciting. And But over time, <laughs> it's just like one after another, <laughs> after another, after another. It just started to, uh, it's, you know, it kind of wears wears on you. So it, it is, um, you know, I've had, uh, you know, a kind of uh, experience of, of kind of bantering back and forth, but all of the reasons that you say, Michael, about the use value of, of being able to, to have contact with all of these people, um, you know, is, is really uh, important. And, there's, and there, there are still surprises as much as um, I can forget that, you know, entering into a fair, but you'll still, you know, there still will be surprises. Um, but one thing I think, uh, especially for us at the Art Institute with one of our particular um, uh, ways that we do acquisitions is with our Society for Contemporary Art. And um, back in the day, this has been going on since 1941, but back in the day, you know, we, we would choose the, the acquisition considerations uh, each year um, through JPEGs or, or for, through slides, you know, at one point. Um, now, um, every single acquisition that we consider and that we bring in for exhibition we've seen, the group has seen in person. And the only way we've been able to do that is because of fairs. So we're able to go to Miami, we're able to go to New York, and we're able to see, you know, all five things before we decide whether to install them uh, in, the, in the finalist exhibition. So that's been a huge um, uh, kind of result of the fairs for us that's been really beneficial. And Dominic? Well, they got me out of the office. <laughs> Uh, which is always nice. They get me to, uh, you know, reconnoiter with the 1%. Uh, you know, haven't kept up with wealth lately. Uh, but, um, you know, to me it's been very funny to be back at the peer show uh, when I was uh, a young curator coming up in the mid-90s. Um, you know, the, the art fair here in Chicago was really at its arguable peak. And I was telling Lisa before, uh, the talk that I feel like I met maybe 70, 80% of the people that I still work with today 
uh, as a young curator, kind of coming to the fair, getting to know a lot of people. Uh, the fair was a really hugely important, I think, for Chicago at that time in terms of bringing a critical mass of people in who would then see the exhibitions that uh, I was then doing at the, uh, uh, at the MCA in Chicago, uh, but also you know, providing an, an extraordinary opportunity to uh, network with colleagues, with collectors from elsewhere, uh, and with artists. And I think you know, having gone from a collecting institution to uh, the uh, non-collecting institution, uh, the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, where I now work, uh, it's, it's really shifted the way that I, you know, use art fairs or the way that they're useful to me. Um, you know, certainly spending time with uh, our patrons, with, with the donors uh, that make the trip, uh, whether it's to Miami or to New York or here to Chicago, uh, that's, you know, obviously valuable time to, you know, really kind of get to know who they are, what they're about, what, what kind of work um, they're interested in, uh, to be able to, you know, really kind of better uh, think about, you know, how uh, what, our, what we're doing at, at CAM is, is reaching uh, a critical audience uh, in St. Louis. Um, but also we get to do things like this, you know, I get to, to hook up with uh, colleagues, I often, you know, meet artists, uh, sometimes accidentally, uh, people I've been wanting to meet for some time, uh, people I didn't know I needed to meet, uh, so they, they provide this incredible kind of, you know, kind of ecology of, of the art world that uh, provides opportunities that, um, you know, kind of, you know, allow you to sort of riff off of, of different things, so. Um, Lisa, uh, maybe you could um, start this um, response to this question. Um, there's a lot of demand on artists to produce work for fairs since there's so many fairs around the world. And particularly an artist that's uh, successful, say like uh, Rashi Johnson right now, you see his work at a, at a number of places. And uh, how do you think the, um, the fairs affect then the artist? You know, because work goes from their studio to the fair, to a collection, and it may not ever be seen in, a, in an exhibition. Uh, so um, how do you all think that, um, that fairs impact artists? Well, I mean, I think it depends on the artists and how prolific they are. I mean, some artists' production uh, lends itself to this, to this kind of uh, uh, you know, fair mentality because they make a lot of work and it's in their sort of easily able to produce work for a number of fairs each year. Um, and uh, but for other artists, I think it's a it's a huge difficulty if an artist is a, you know maybe a really slow painter who's making you know uh, one or two paintings a year. A fair you know situation is just not um, going to be that uh, beneficial to them uh, because they're just you know there just isn't enough to keep up with the demand of a of a fair. Um, but hopefully, I mean, I think in most cases the dealers understand who their artists are and you know are are kind of. Um, working within that mentality, so you know they're not necessarily, hopefully, not putting too much pressure on artists who, who, you know, don't work in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if a work goes, you know, from a fair to a collector and you know never, you know, reaches an institution, I mean that that is a part of the <laughs> that is that is and never is in an exhibition. I mean, even at a gallery, you know, there would be, you know potential for an exhibition, you know, and what you're seeing here is, you know, maybe one example of the artist's work completely out of context. So it, I think it, you know, I, I won't say for sure that I think it's, you know, damaging or, or what, but I think it really depends on the artist and how they work. Uh, Michael, what's your thoughts on that? And well, also, would you rather see a solo show in a booth or would you rather, um, you know, have a mix of things? I think I'll, I'll pick up on your first question because it was something that, that I worry about a lot and I just sort of had this realization talking to somebody last night that I mean I, I really worry about young artists especially not having enough time to, to develop their work slowly to, to kind of make mistakes and fix those mistakes before mm -hmm. they're in the spotlight and I think as money has poured into the art world and galleries are getting bigger and opening branches in multiple cities and fairs are populating all over that there's a it seems like a big rush on the part of a lot of galleries to kind of keep you know, restocking their their stable, finding young artists, and I and I th and I do see. I think you could say that there maybe is a, a drop off in quality control that's maybe been happening, where artists again they're not allowed to kind of really hone their craft before they're pushed out there as the next big thing, 
and and some of them haven't you know created enough of a foundation that they will be able to sustain that career beyond so there's a i'd say you know a, a real risk of of burnout mm -hmm. uh, early burnout um because of this kind of maniacal pace that uh, that we're on and, and that we're that we're in right now um and um but I, and I think you know some. I'm, sometimes I think a solo presentation at an art fair is is good for a viewer like myself. I think it's pr oftentimes can be quite risky for a dealer. You know, it's if you read the read the city wrong or the context wrong and bring the wrong artist, you know, I think it could be probably pretty disastrous. But mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes it does give you that kind of clarity um, that you don't get in a in a more of a hodgepodge type way but um i'm i'm an inveterate uh, thrift store shopper and uh, <laughs> yard sale and um, flea market goer so i've sort of trained my eye to kind of find little things in in a crazy chaotic mess so it's, it's still that feels kind of uh it feels natural to me yeah i think what you were saying about um how it affects an artist to have this demand for production i started out as an artist and i in the um late 80s, early 90s, I showed at Chicago Art Fair a number of times when it was here on the Navy Pier with a number of galleries. And my uh, primary gallery at that time was Herschel and Adler Modern, and they did fairs, they did Art Basel, they did uh, Art Chicago, they did Cologne, they did major fairs around the world, and they were always asking me for more work. And it was frustrating to make work that would be put up on the wall the first day I'd give them five, six new pieces. They'd sell them, take them down, or at FIAC as well. And FIAC at that time was like eight days. And, um, I, and nobody was able to see this. And then we couldn't even borrow the pieces back for an exhibition then. You know? I mean, so it, 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 it can be to where you feel like you're starting to just be an employee of a gallery that you're making work for a context. You know? What do you think, Dominic? Uh, yes, but on the other hand, uh, I think so many of the art fairs, this one included, uh, have developed these other kinds of, um, you know, these project-oriented uh, mm -hmm. spaces or opportunities. Uh, we're the beneficiary of one. We have a booth with a wonderful young artist who just moved from uh, St. Louis to Baltimore named Lauren Adams, and she has created a project that is an extension of the exhibition that she has up at uh, the Contemporary at the moment. And so it's really allowed her to not only expand that project and, and create an, an entirely different audience uh, for uh, that project that we have in St. Louis, uh, but I think you know, a lot of, I've seen a lot of incredibly memorable things at some of the art fairs uh, around the world that, you know, where artists have been given an opportunity mm -hmm. to do a specific project. Simon Fujiwara at the 2010 uh, Freeze, an extraordinary piece where he created uh, almost this false uh, excavated city that you'd sort of look through uh, in the floor of the, the Freeze Art Fair through, through glass. Uh, you know, Tina Segal had a, a, a project, the first time I'd seen uh, or experienced his work uh, at Freeze, I think a couple years before. And so, um, you know, while I think, yeah, I have worked with artists who, you know, are saying, yeah, I have to really finish this piece for free, uh, for, you know, Basel or something. Uh, on the other hand, there's opportunities that artists are given to reach a completely different audience or, and present their work in, in actually sometimes a very uh, fleshed out and, and very fulfilled way. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things that fairs have started to do in, say, the last 10 years versus a fair from 20 years ago, which was just then a straight art fair, a trade show, um, that they've created these spaces where institutions, um, you know, local art centers, uh, museums, can uh, have some presentation as well, like the uh, Ruppersburg uh, presentation here for the Art Institute of Chicago or um, you know, I mean, you have the store here. Is there a, is there a project here from the museum no, as well? No, not from not from the MCA. Yeah, but the project that um, that Dominic mentions is is a really successful, very dynamic project as well, that engages the audience and gives them a chance to interact with an artist in a very interesting way. Um, I was just going to say that this fair is, is, has done a, a remarkably good job of trying to integrate those yeah. things um, more successfully, I think, than maybe other fairs have done in terms of the nonprofit spaces and making uh, you know, a real a area for a project as opposed to 
you know, just a kind of booth with a table and some flyers. And I mean, I think they thought it through um, very well about how they were going to integrate nonprofits into into the to the mix. And uh, one other thing I was going to add too, kind of even almost sort of counter to what I said earlier, is that I oftentimes when I'm meeting young artists, especially people working outside of major art centers like New York or LA or um, other cities, maybe even Chicago, that that often I find them at a real disadvantage if the galleries they're working with aren't aggressively going out and doing art fairs because mm -hmm. there, there are so few opportunities to make sales in those cities where they live mm -hmm. and the exposure that a fair like this gives is so crucial. So, um, I mean, to me, I think that's something a young artist needs to think about when they're choosing a gallery is, is, is how... Uh, willing that gallery is to go out into the world, you know, p cities around the world and, and, you know, flog their work because I, th I think it's just a, a new reality that, uh, that that's how people like us, collectors, uh, critics, others see the work and then can start, you know, uh, working with it further and increasing the, uh, the exposure. So it's, it's I think uh, it's become a real necessity. Well, to build on that, Michael, I think, you know, having, you know, spent so much of my career here in Chicago, seeing galleries, like, really thrive and develop in ways that they hadn't when I started my career here uh, because of art fairs, because they were able to, you know, really bring um, artists' work and, and, and create a different kind of clientele for, for these artists' work um, at NADA, at, at LISTA, at these other places, I think was extraordinary and something that, you know, really not only helped, I think, you know, establish certain galleries here for the long haul, uh, but also really uh, make Chicago a much uh, a better place for artists to live and work and stay and not move to, you know, the coast. I think, Nothing wrong yeah, with Yeah, I coast. think fairs have played a, a really important role over the years um, in Chicago's relationship to the rest of the world and the rest of the art world. But uh, Margot Levin Gallery in Los Angeles recently announced um, that she was closing her gallery after 40 years because people are no longer interested in a thoughtful gallery experience. Um, and she, you know, she came to this conclusion um, after going to Art Basel, uh, s having someone buy a work, and when the person uh, gave her their card, it turned out that they lived in Beverly Hills, right? So they hadn't been into the gallery, but they discovered this work at an art fair. Um, so how do you think art fairs are affecting this experience of actually seeing a show in a gallery as opposed to just seeing product on the walls? I mean, I, I, I would say, I mean, I know how much hard work it is to go out and see shows and, you know, in, in a city like New York, a city like LA, even here in Chicago. I mean, for professionals like us where this is our job to do it, it, is, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time to get around and see things. And the average collector, person that's interested in art that has a, a day job, um, you know, can't do it the way we do it. So this sort of one-stop shopping idea of an art fair is I think it's a reality. I don't. I think it's um, it's hard to ask even our most dedicated collectors to go out there and see every single show the way that we try to do it. And uh, so, so you know, I, I wouldn't fault that person from Beverly Hills that lives down the street from Margo for not seeing it. You know, but um, um, I, I mean, I think I think that happens all the time. Lisa. Well, and uh, but I would, I would, yeah, and I would say that it, it's probably not just that people don't appreciate it, seeing shows anymore, but it, you know, just the sake of time, there are so many galleries, there are so many um, artists, there are so many hours in the day, um, and so you know, people are limited, and the and the art fair pr provides a context. But I think there's also been a movement, you know, like for instance with Berlin Art Weekend, um, Gallery Weekend, where galleries are trying to bring. Uh, people back into the galleries mm -hmm. again, make an event out of gallery going again. And Chicago has has been doing the same. And um, you know, this is the second year now of uh, Chicago Gallery Weekend. But I, th I think, and it's also aligned this year with Art Fair. So I mean, maybe it's um, you know, we'll see at the end um, how that has worked out. But I mean, I think there has been this sense that like you know, people want that too, you know, I mean, uh, Gallery Weekend in Berlin is incredibly popular and just, you know, kind of hopping around from space to space, but really seeing solo shows again in a gallery setting um, is something that I think there are, there is an audience for that and there is some, you know, but it, it the art fairs have undoubtedly uh, changed the, the landscape for galleries, absolutely, there's no question. 
Yeah, probably in terms of the you know, economics of it, but, you know, being an optimistic kind of guy, I kind of hope that, you know, art fairs are a great way for people to see a range of things and hopefully we'll follow up on, uh, you know, allow them to be introduced to, to certain kinds of artists and then hopefully see their gallery shows or, you know, take more longer sustained uh, looks at some other point. Let's hope. <laughs> Um, in his talk yesterday, uh, Jerry Saltz called art fairs moving tent casino cities <laughs> and asked the audience without, without getting a, an answer, but this is my question to you. He asked, are we driving them or are they driving us? Who's, who's we? Who's the them and who's the us? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like, you know, are the, are the art fairs driving us oh. or, you know, or is the audience driving the art fair? I would say both. I mean, I think that the art fairs are, su are successful because people are coming and, and buying work at them, and, and when if people stop doing that, then they won't be successful. And I think that people are coming, that, that art fairs, you know, are also encouraging people to look at work in this way, and so people are. Um, I, I mean, again, I don't think it's, you know, I think there's still absolutely a place for the galleries and that galleries have to, you know, do the do the shows and, and maintain relationships with artists and have, you know, and archive their work and, you know, all of the things that galleries do that are so incredibly crucial to what we do <laughs> um, and to and to what artists do. But, you know, the fair is just another another context. What's your thought, Dominic? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of I'm I'm inclined to think anything that uh, that it's you know the rising tide lifts all boats. That you know anything that uh, helps get people more familiar with contemporary art gets them excited about it. Um, can't be bad. Uh, can't be bad for us. Uh, you know, and I also I mean one thing that I I was thinking about you know, when we were talking about, um, you know, art fairs and what they do for artists, I mean, one of the things, and, and the way that it's changed with, you know, doing new projects at, at art fairs and so forth is the fact that we're here. Um, we're doing this uh, talk that art fairs have sort of expanded to include these, you know, uh, these lectures and panels and that they're much better attended than they used to be. Um, I don't know if it was the art fair, if it was the people on stage or whatever it was, but like the first, I think the first one of these that I did was in Chicago with Lisa's colleague, James Rondo, uh, Mary Lou Canode, who's now in St. Louis with me, and uh, who else? Rochelle Steiner, who was then in St. Louis. Um, there were like six people in the audience and we were talking about like, you know, art in the Midwest and being a museum curator, blah, blah, blah. Um, and here, I mean, you know, this is a pretty good crowd. Uh, and so the fact that, you know, art fairs are able to include Jerry Saltz talking about art fairs, us talking about art fairs, uh, Sterling Ruby talking about his work, um, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it, it expands people's knowledge about, about what's going on and provides them perhaps with a more accessible way of relating to contemporary art than some other um, uh, you know, situations. I, I think too that um, one of the crucial factors for a successful fair is that it happens in a city where there's things going on that you want to see. Um, and I, I would hope that Chicago is that kind of a place that w where a lot of people want to come to Chicago. They want to see what's happening at the Art Institute, the MCA, the Renaissance Society, all these great f galleries and things that we have here. Um, and when the, when the fair wasn't um, as as robust as this, you know, it, that wasn't happening, and and so I think um, for for me at least, you know, when there's a, an affair like freeze when freeze happens, you know, it gets me to London, so I can go to the Tate and I can go to Whitechapel and see all these things. So it, it provides a another lure to kind of drag you to that to that city and to see things, and and usually the cities really respond and pull out great put on great shows, um, and so I think I think it um, it's a nice, you know prodding uh, that it provides because we obviously we have all this choice where do where do we go next to go look for art and so it really helps to organize our our, t our time which maybe turns us into lemmings but I don't know. <laughs> um, but it, I, I think it like Dominic says accidentally you start to discover all kinds of things when you just have that extra little little lure of the, of the fair to bring you to that city. No, and, to, and to do studio visits. I mean you know you and I would uh, go see David Thorpe when we were in London or mm -hmm. you know uh, you know in New York uh, 
I often, you know, combine the fair with the opportunity to, to do studio visits, um, you know, whether it's here, whether it's New York, maybe not Basel, but, you know. No, I agree, because it's like for me, too, as a critic, when I come here, I look at what's at the galleries, what is it that I could possibly write about, what's at the museums, and go to see those shows and have that experience as well, which I have, have been having every day that I've been here. Um, so um, what then, as curators, when you go to fairs, what, what is it that makes a worthwhile art fair, a worthwhile experience for you? Do you want to start, Michael? Sure. Um, I mean, I, 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 I definitely pay attention to the list of galleries that a fair is, is advertising and will make a decision based on, on the, the reputation collectively of that, of that group. And um, so that's the first, the first thing I, I, I really look at. And um, if, it's, if it looks like a dynamic group of galleries and that, that I respect and trust and, and know show good work, that will, that will get me there. And hopefully, it'll, if, you know, it's in a great city where, where there are other things that I would naturally want to go see, artists to go visit, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, to me, that's, that's the number one thing is, is the quality, the quality control. And, have, and keeping it within a manageable kind of scale like, like this, I think, uh, helps too. I think there have been a few fairs um, that have gotten too big and they're too unmanageable and not fun to walk around in because it's just... Mm -hmm. I, I have a little slight claustrophobia, I think, and so <laughs> like these nice wide aisles and space to breathe, um, you know, definitely makes a difference, I think. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what Michael said, too. I mean, I, I you know, it's, it's I, I, can't, I can't go to the mall, so I, I'm, you know, particularly choosy about, you know, the, the quality of the, of the experience and the use value, what else is going on in the city. Um, also, artists that I may be working with or wanting to work with, uh, you know, are, are they traveling there as well, and, and, or do they live nearby, and can I, can I also use that opportunity to meet with an artist that, um, you know, so that we can further discuss a project that, that we're working on together, uh, as opposed to making a, a separate trip um, to do that, and, and that's often worked very well, um, in term, uh, particularly in Basel. Uh, and New York. It's always very interesting about, you know, walking around an art fair with, um, and particularly, you know, collectors or, or people who support the museum is, you know, you see things you hadn't seen before, hadn't thought about, or you kind of get into their um, aesthetic. And it's sort of like there's this guy, um, a collector here in Chicago, Pavon Siegel, who I went around the Freeze New York fair. He has a completely different taste than I do. You know, it's like very process oriented, very abstract. I'm more subject matter content kind of guy. Uh, but it really introduced me to like a lot of things that I hadn't really been aware of or, you know, galleries, artists, etc. So it's always, it's a learning experience for us as well. Um, obviously the biggest fairs are our Basel, our Basel Miami Beach, Freeze, the Armory Show, Fiat, Arco. I mean, you know, there's so many. But there's a number of smaller fairs, like in, uh, in Brussels, in Vienna, uh, in Berlin, um, or Bogota. What does it take to get you, other than maybe being invited as a, uh, to be on a panel, what does it take to bring, bring you or to lure you to visit uh, one of these types of fairs, particularly, like say, like Art Brussels or something like that? Free tickets, <laughs> uh, airfare. You know, yeah. I mean, every now and then, sometimes get a little dangled, the little like, please come and we'll pay your way. And you know, I mean, sometimes it's 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 that's is because we don't have unlimited travel budgets. You mm -hmm. know, we're nonprofit institutions and or time. Yeah, time you know, I mean, I went to a really lame one in Milan, but you know, it's Milan. You give me yeah. a free flight and hotel. I'm mm -hmm. there. <laughs> you hear me, Milan? <laughs> How about you, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I haven't been to many of those. I think it would, you know, require a, either there's, you know, an artist that I'm specifically, yeah. you know, that lives there, and yeah. I want, you know, like I want to meet with Vienna them. Like if it was Vienna or something like that. Exactly, that yeah. I can, you know, do, do double duty and, and, and see or, or a major museum exhibition that, you know, is really important for, you know, with an artist that I'm working with, something like that could, could you know, lure me. Um, but, yeah, a, a, otherwise it's, you know, like Michael said, like lemmings, you know, we sort of go <laughs> to, the, to the major ones where we know we're going to see the most important galleries that we're mm -hmm. working with and then, you know. Um, so obviously fairs are a place to discover new artists. Um, have you discovered artists at a fair that you can recollect that you have included in uh, an exhibition at any time? Or? 
I, I know I have, but I might have to think <laughs> about it before I f remember who what, what a, good, a good example might be. Um. Tina Segal um, was, I'd first seen his work at Freeze, and I didn't put it in a show, but it wound up being uh, an acquisition that the MCA made because I told another curator, she looked at it or experienced it, and bada boom, bada bing. Well, I, one, one that does come to mind to me is uh, for a long time I kept going to Freeze again and kept look, seeing and recognizing how distinctive the cabinet gallery mm. s uh, mm -hmm. stand always looks. And there was you know, this just really clear aesthetic that they have. And I kept seeing this artist, Enrico David, who I really, I kept liking. And uh, that's Enrico David again. And uh, so when I was in Seattle, uh, ended up buying a work and doing a show with him. And, and you know, so he's, I mean, that would be a, a clear example where you know, some, something in all of this you know, stands out and looks different, looks fresh and new, and, and you know, ends up becoming something um, that, that definitely sustains itself over, over time. Mm -hmm. be just one of, of probably many examples that, that, that comes to mind for me. I, mean, I, I did do um, an exhibition, a focus exhibition with an artist that I saw for the first time in a scope fair in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only time that's ever happened, but it was, you know, her name was Jana Gunstheimer. She's a young German artist and mm -hmm. was uh, uh, showing with a Swiss gallery and it just, the work struck me and then I went, um, you know, to visit to visit her and to visit the gallery in Zurich and it was uh, you know it just kind of happened that way but I would say it's relatively rare um, that something like that just out of nowhere um, comes more, more often it's it's to, to kind of develop you know continue developing relationship that's already been established in some other way I I know Dominic works at a, an institution that's non collecting right but yep. um, for uh, Lisa and Michael um, do you look at the fair for acquisitions as well yeah for for sure i mean um oftentimes you know we we it sounds like this might be the case with lisa too we might be in conversation with the gallery beforehand about an artist they might use the fair as an opportunity to bring work by that artist to the fair put it on hold for us to look at and, and so it becomes kind of like a mobile viewing room for us um and again where we can get lots of our, our supporters in front of that piece at the, at the same at the same time so um it's not only just the happenstance and uh, of of fa falling upon a piece that's that a dealer might have happened to bring but sometimes there's there's lots more uh intentionality in how that comes to be and how, and how we come to kind of look at the piece so mm -hmm. there's a lot of advanced conversation yeah. Um, yeah I mean I think uh, dealers who know that that institutions or particular collectors who work with institutions are looking for a particular artists work and they know they have a great example that will be at the fair will give advance notice to the institution that they you know would like to to see it you know first and mm -hmm. So those kinds of conversations are happening all the time. And um, you know, we, we're, we're never in a position of just like walking into a booth and writing a check. Obviously, we, you know, we have whole processes that can take years sometimes to acquire works of art. Um, but uh, you know, if we're working with, with collectors um, you know, who can do that, um, or obviously galleries also understand that museums um, can take a long time with that process. Don't expect that we're, you know, we'll put something on hold and you know, it can be the beginning of a conversation or somewhere in the middle of a conversation, but, yeah. For, uh, and Dominic, I mean, if obviously the muse Contemporary Art Museum in uh, St. Louis doesn't collect, but you have a board, or do you work with them as far as, like, you see something, you, you, you tell them about it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny, and having, you know, previously worked for a, uh, you know, non a, a collecting institution, um, you know, the, one of our colleagues, Laura Hopman, during uh, um, a curator's conference referred to it as shadow collecting. Uh, this notion of like kind of really developing uh, your, uh, you know, your, your board, your, your, your collectors in town's taste by, you know, kind of working with them, bring, you know, showing them what you were interested in. I think in other ways, you know, art fairs are ways that we communicate to our board members. Uh, actually be able to show them works of artists that are coming up in the program, uh, familiarize, um, you know, really educate uh, our board about, you know, the artists that we're passionate about, that we uh, really uh, feel are, are setting uh, the tone for what's going on. And so, um, you know, even though we're, you know, not going to, you know, write a check, uh, you know, it's a way for us to, um, you know, kind of 
make our, our program come to life in a way by allowing people to actually see things that maybe we've been showing them in PowerPoints for like the last you know five or six months. Yeah, and it's the opportunity to bring work into your community yeah. that you may see here that's coming from a gallery in Germany or coming from a gallery in Italy or gallery from California as well. Um, Chuck Arnaldi uh, said that for an artist to go to an art fair is like a cow to go to a slaughterhouse. <laughs> Um, you, I, I've seen a lot of artists here at the fair, um, but th I know that there's some artists that feel very uncomfortable. They get, they get envious, they get edgy, they get depressed when they come to fairs. What are your experiences with different <laughs> artists that, um, you know, and their reactions to fairs? Uh, maybe uh, Lisa, start. Well, and I've also seen artists take take full advantage of what a fair can do, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and and manipulate the system to make sure that there, you know, a particular work of art is on view at a museum nearby when the the, the major fair is happening, and everyone will be there. And you know, I mean, there are ways that that you can really take advantage of the situation. But I think for for the most part, it probably is just you know, not an ideal place for an artist to, to spend time other than, again, to meet with people. You know, how many, like, coffees in the VIP lounge have I had with various artists that I was working on shows with? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we were just there at the same time and it just worked out, you know, very well to do that. So, I mean, I think, you know, they're like, they, like us, you know, are using it, you know, as a, as a place to, to kind of convene with, with their, their, their peers and their and and collectors and and curators who are interested in learning more about their work and you know it's it's you know it's just part of the it's part of our reality now I think it's part of their reality now that they sometimes have to stand in a booth and talk about their work for a half a day or a day. Right. Uh, Michael. I mean I, I I think what Lisa says is absolutely true but and and most of the artists that I talk to you know hate these things and it, i think it comes back to my very first comment because they they're used to showing their art in a environment in a situation that they can control and and put real thought into and the juxtapositions of things and the spacing and the light and all of that and, and here it just gets thrown into a jumble no matter how sensitively the, their dealer installs it because who knows who's your next door neighbor is going to be who knows how close to the cafe or the bathroom or whatever it might be so it's it's i think there's this pure white cube modernist idea that this uh uh, works against that uh, and, and and I mean some of them I think the the comp the commercial part you know the the casual viewing and circulation that happens is is also probably a little distressing to artists but As it should be. yeah I've had some artists who I'm like I'm gonna have to have an intervention to like you know pull them aside so you need to <laughs> stop going to art fairs <laughs> um, but I think you know like us art artists like to look at art and you know it's like a big voyeur fest here it's just like you know just go and like see all kinds of stuff, not only, you know, their peers, but also more historical works and like really incredible, weird, you know, special examples of, of you know, more uh, established or even dead artists. Um, or, you know, some interesting, you know, curated presentations like the, the, the presentation at uh, Corbett versus Dempsey here is like really, really, you know, kind of a visual experience in and of itself. And so, you know, I think it, it kind of cuts both ways, you know. I think, you know, with certain artists, it's like, yeah, maybe they might want to, you know, stop. Maybe it's the expectations that they have coming to an art fair or what it's going to, to mean or something. But, um, you know, just as an opportunity to see this incredible array of work, you know, it's kind of good for that. Yeah, and it is a, a definitely can be a reflection of what the, the, the uh, zeitgeist is yeah. of the moment as well. I mean, and that's that's can sometimes be by happenstance that uh, you know that you all of a sudden you walk down the aisles and instead of seeing uh, figurative paintings in every booth, you start to see the kind of emergence of abstraction again or something like that. Or artists that you hadn't seen in like I feel like in yeah. uh, maybe it was ba uh, Miami Basel. It was like you know tons of like Mona Hatoum whose work yeah. I hadn't seen. For a number of years, and well, or like Lawrence Carroll here at um, at Karsten Greve, you know, a whole almost a whole room of those mm -hmm. as well. And uh, I haven't seen Lawrence's work in a number of years, yeah. and yet it fits the time mm -hmm. as well, though. You know, or like at Tefaf, um, which uh, this big art fair in Maastricht, which has everything from old masters to contemporary. Um, 
to um, see like the Zero Group or something like that, or the Gutai uh, Group, you know, being resurrected again. You know. Or I think artists too that might again work outside of a, a major art center in a more regional place might think that what they're doing is is super unique and 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 end all be all and because they're working in somewhat of a vacuum maybe haven't been had access and so an art fair can be a good uh barometer to see uh, show what other artists are doing and maybe that they're not alone in what they're doing and, and i think it, it can be a bit of a corrective sometimes too so or a bit of a reality check so it's, it's not it's not always a bad thing yeah. um so maybe um we can open the uh, floor up to some questions now um, I'm sure uh, many of you have questions for uh, for these um, distinguished curators. Um, does um, someone have the microphone? Um, okay. So, yeah, there <laughs> you go. Uh, you can, he'll give you the mic. Um, I just thought maybe you'd like to know, I think there's an awful lot of people that come to art fairs that are not part of the 1%. They may have a little money to spend, and um, or maybe not. They just love art. But they might find it intimidating to go to galleries, because if you go in there, you either have to have a huge body of art historical knowledge or be part of the 1%. So from the consumer standpoint, I think art fairs are an easy place to go and be around art and look at art where you don't have to be one of those extremes. So I just thought, maybe, I hope you know that. It's not all, <coughs> yeah, we're a lot all, of people that come to these oh yeah. things. We're are, all part of the 99 I just wanted to work <laughs> this in as a joke. I mean. <laughs> but I, I do think, I, I personally think one of the problems galleries have is that they talk down to people who don't know the, the jargon of art history and oh, this looks like a this and a this and a this. And, they don't want to go in there because they're treated But you like don't have to be a player to go into a gallery, believe me. I mean, right. you know, it's like a lot of us go into galleries anonymously as well. We may know the, ga the gallery owner in New York. You might go into a gallery, but nowadays you never see the owner. They're behind a closed door. So, you know, you go in and you see the 25-year-old the, the that works at the front desk. They don't know. They don't even know to tell the director that you're here. Right, but, and so we get attitude from experience. those people too. So we, yeah. it, it yeah, is, yeah, I think yeah. you're absolutely just, right yeah. about the intimidation. The man on the street going oh, yeah. to a gallery, they sometimes are treated like idiots. Yeah. So, but that happens to us as well. An yeah. Environment that yeah. they don't maybe feel that way. Yeah. Right. I think it's a great so point. I think it's just yeah. part of it's from our standpoint. Maybe it's a great way to look at art and and get to know art without mm -hmm. feeling like you have to put yourself out on the line. There. And yeah. again, I think it's like a way for, you know, a, a, an urban location to get enthusiastic about it. I was, you know, the thing I always find funny is like when you go to like London around Freeze, you have all these people who are like kind of either they've been planning this for a while. They have like whatever performance art project they've been dreaming <laughs> up for the year. And it's, you know, large and in charge and on view. And it's just like it's a it's an opportunity for them to kind of feel a part of this larger entity, which I always find really, you know, kind of fun and lovely yeah. and strange and I just hope they don't <laughs> come near me but you know uh, you know but I think they they, they, they function in, in that capacity as well but you know they you know th I'm gonna be curious to see like tomorrow on Saturday uh, you know the fact that uh, again it int introduces um, you know what we do what we work with to such a, a, a huge audience that's not part of the mm -hmm. people who actually pay for it or, or own it um, that that makes them so important in a, in a way Mary, did you have a question? Yeah, um, here, give her the mic. Hi, um, I'm glad that um, my neighbor feels more comfortable to come into a, an art fair and that it feels more democratic. But um, as a dealer who has a gallery, I wanted to say that we try very hard all the time to provide exhibitions you know, year round and to do the kind of research, excavation and support of individual artists. Um, you mentioned the Good Thai group, which mm -hmm. uh, is one, but many of my colleagues have championed artists who are quite difficult to support or to work with. And that's a long-term work, whereas in a museum, you can do a show and shake hands and say goodbye, but a gallery is there year after year. Um, so sometimes we're behind closed doors because we're talking to our artists or <laughs> trying to do other work, but um, we all want visitors and we all love to talk about our artists and to talk about art and I hope that 
you'll come and visit and, and won't feel, <laughs> and won't feel, because I do feel sometimes galleries get a bad rep, and, um, and I do feel that most of my colleagues work really hard to produce an event like this or produce shows that are worthy of people like you visiting and that will draw the public. Mary's from uh, Gallery Le Long in New York, um, which does do really, really thoughtful shows. And Anybody nice, else? clear but glass, like, you know, easy yeah. doors to go through rather than, <laughs> like, you know, frosted glass that are, like, way two tons. I think sometimes, <laughs> you know, there is an intimidation factor at some other spaces, not yours, of course, Mary. But there's also galleries, too, that, you know, there are gallerists that uh, it's all about sales, but then there's also, I mean, you know, People would accuse maybe Gagosian Gallery being all about sales, but yet they do shows like Manzoni, they do shows like Picasso that are absolutely incredible and you know are equal to museum quality shows. Um, someone back there, uh, Robert? Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed the panel very much. Um, I would like to say that I thought it was interesting that uh, Paul brought up the point of a gallery closing in LA, um, Margo Levin in relation to the way in which fairs have somehow influenced the way people see the activity of viewing art and, and the involvement of, of, of seeing art. And because so many of the fairs have, uh, there's pressure on the dealers to sell and to, to make uh, business, that they bring a, a, a full range of artists work mm -hmm. to the fair to show and it becomes an overwhelming experience in many cases because there is so much to look at. But then when Paul mentioned Lawrence Carroll and the way at Karsten Grev and the way it looks um, next to Cy Twombly's work to see them next to each other, it's a particular booth that I happen to remember. I've only been through once so <laughs> far, I have to walk through again. But that stuck with me. And I think that the ADAA in New York, for just one example, mm -hmm. has been encouraging dealers to do one person mm -hmm. shows in addition to other galleries doing a, an array of, of work. So I would say maybe it's the time for an art fair or art fairs to think about having curators like your panel come and do a side exhibition, maybe an extension of a show that they currently have up at their museum or just a show that they would like to do as a part of an art fair so that people would have that kind of curated exhibition that Margot Levin is saying people aren't experiencing at art fairs. And perhaps mm -hmm. it's an opportunity now to encourage art fairs to extend beyond the, the single gallery showing their wares and to encourage either galleries or curators to come in and do a special exhibition that would be focused on a particular individual or a theme show. For example, uh, one more point I'll say. When I left here yesterday, I went to the SAIC installation of Roger Brown's work. It was incredible. And to see Roger Brown's work, that much of it, all in one location. And then I felt after having been here and seen so much, I was mm -hmm. able to see in depth a particular artist. And it, and it was, a, in some ways, a, 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 I don't want to say an antidote, but a, but a kind of a relief to be able to see someone's work in depth. A, a compliment, this, yeah. This huge yeah. array. Anyone want to respond to that? Well, I think there's a place for both. I mean, I think there are, there are a number of you know kind of curated projects here at the fair, including um, the one you mentioned, Lauren. Yeah. Adams, yeah, but you know, I th I think w you know while it's always great to see you know a, a gallery present one artist in depth, I also really do like to see you get a sense of a, a gallery's you know identity. I their think program, through yeah. their program through uh, you know the presentation of multiple artists. I think it's a way that you kind of see how artists fit into that. But I also feel it's always interesting to see, you kind of look at artists a bit differently if they, you know, depending on which gallery context they're in. Mm -hmm. You know, certain artists have, you know, multiple galleries mm -hmm. and, you know, you like, see them. Um, um, Jessica Stockholders at three yeah. different galleries. Here. Yeah, or you see Liam Gillick in like mm -hmm. the context of uh, Casey Kaplan, and it means one thing you see him in the context of Maureen Paley. It's like a completely different sort of, mm -hmm. you know, feeling or understanding of that particular artist. And so, you know, I think there's room for both. Lisa or Michael, any either of you want to respond? Um, but let, maybe we'll take the next question then. Um, sir, back there. Yeah. Um, I apologize if you've covered this because I came in a little bit late, but 
Um, I'm wondering with something like Expo Chicago relative to um, a city like Chicago where there's uh, sort of uh, the market's very sketchy, you know, that's not super established. If um, something like Expo Chicago provides, you know, this, this thing that's sort of, uh, sort of, you know, outrunning the uh, independent spaces of the city that cater more to curating immaterial or objectless practices. Um, if, you know, because there's so much like cheaper real estate in the city than, you know, like in mm -hmm. New York or even in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, that actually these, these two things are, are sort of trying to constantly outrun each other. Um, in, and perhaps they're, they're talking, uh, they're having two parallel conversations and there, there's no overlap, so there's no problem. But I wonder how you see this relative to like immaterial or objectless practices, performances, installations. Um, you know, when you have someone like Boris Groys writing that, you know, in the past few years, that installation is the, you know, sort of more democratic practice um, because more and more art of the art viewing audience is not of the purchasing audience. So it sort mm -hmm. of like works in tandem with them. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, my initial thought, and then I'll let everyone else respond, is that, you know, the spaces that you're talking about function as a laboratory, and then what you see at an art fair is, is kind of like the, f the, the, the finished results, even though sometimes there are things that might appear on the walls here that are still experimental. But, you know, uh, what's your thoughts, uh, uh, Michael? Uh, yeah, I think, I think um, you know, as, as long as it's sort of well publicized and organized, you know, that, that somehow to kind of get all of the folks here kind of out to see those kinds of experiences <laughs> is, a, is a great thing. I don't know how much of that is really happening kind of this weekend here or not. Um, but it might be something to, to think about in the future because, like you said, mm -hmm. there are all kinds of great spaces where people are doing experimental things here in Chicago, and that might still be invisible to a, a more general, fair-going public, I would say. Yeah, and I think that, that you know, when, when we have colleagues who are coming into Chicago, you know, and they're coming for the fair, and they know they'll be here for a few days, and they, they all ask, you know, well, what, you know, what else is there to do? And, and then mm -hmm. that's, you know, they, they want to see these kind of uh, alternative spaces and other experiences as well. And, um, and and Chicago is really rich with them, as you say. And I think it's a, you know, I, I, again, we don't, I'm, I don't think any of us know exactly what Expo is maybe done in that regard. Although I, I, I know that it, you know, they did a lot with a, a range of nonprofits to try to, you know, integrate that into their programming in some way, um, and to to bring people, uh, you know, together for a range of different experiences. But, um, you know, it is a it's a good point. But I think there's sort of there's simultaneous practices, as you know, as Paul said too. You know, there's like a kind of experimental space for for creating work and making you know maybe having conversation or you know more social practice or you know all, a lot of the different areas that you're kind of talking about that are not object based um, this is very clearly uh, a, a market driven experience for the most part um. yeah and I wonder again um, you know if it's just going to take some time or you know I think whether there was maybe a bit of you know a sort of tentative kind of like we'll see how Expo Chicago does whether it sort of returns you know the kind of energy that that you know the art fair had for Chicago back in uh, like the 90s when it was really in its heyday um, you know and, and and whether again that sort of you know the tide will lift all boats whether you know the kind of uh, urgency that uh, and, and enthusiasm that I think you know an art fair can create within uh, a locality uh, will really begin to sort of, you know, reverberate out uh, not only to the museums and galleries, but also to more independent spaces as well. Um, you know, I think even though it's, you know, this become this kind of like bloated monster, you know, I still get out to like locust projects when mm -hmm. I go to Miami and, I was and get out to more independent well, yeah. uh, spaces, depending on what they have up, but also as a matter of course, because I know that they do good things. And so, you know, I think you know, over time, hopefully, the, the, this fair will establish itself. It'll be able to better uh, promote the, the, the broad range of things that are, I sound like a spokesperson for the fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Dominic and I, we met in Miami, yeah. and um, it, it, it's true, like spaces like a 
the experimental space like locust project you know we we all kind of because there was another night that there was openings in that neighborhood or something so i think that i know that there's a shuttle bus that takes people to four different neighborhoods i don't know you know if some of these spaces that you're talking about are in those areas but you know for next year if not then they you should try to get that platform included as well um another question uh or ma'am uh, right there the uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. Take your um, Well, I, I was wondering, maybe um, Dominic could expand upon what you were saying in terms of the expansion, because I think that it probably does a lot for, and then it, the, um, well, everyone can talk about this, is how, what, what does a art fair bring to your city um, afresh, because it's been a while since there's been a real strong one here, and um, what happens if there's too many art fairs and curators, collectors, dealers are all going to be spread too thin? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so that's the big fear. We are too. We are too. We are too. We are spread too thin. Everybody is, um, you know. And and uh, you know, this has been this has been the conversation as mm -hmm. Expo's been developing all along. Is is you know it, the, making all the right decisions. You know, doing a, a beautiful job. Making you know really uh, making a huge effort to to do. Um, you know, a fair exactly the way a fair should should be, um, but <laughs> um, if people don't come and people don't buy, then then that's kind of it. So uh, we're rooting for them. We're here yeah. <laughs> on this panel. Yeah, we're doing important. our part. We're supporting the fair, and you know, in in all the ways. But you know, I think the idea is that yeah, people are exhausted, and and it has to really prove to be a place that people want to come back to. You know again and again. I don't think it's a problem that Art Basel or Art Basel Miami Beach or Freeze necessarily thinks about, but still the Armory Show th thinks about that because they have competition now yeah. from Freeze New York as well. But having been here for, you know, to see, you know, the art fair in Chicago go from like, you know, the thing to, mm -hmm. you know, really kind of symbolically like, you know, uh, disappearing. It it hurt. It it there was a certain collective identity that you know we all in the in the Chicago art community invested in with the fair, and you know felt a sense of pride that we had this like really great art fair. And when that started to dissipate, when people stopped coming and stopped coming to see our shows at the MCA or at other places, um, you know th I think that was why it kind of continued on even in its diminished state for so long. People just wanted there to be something like maybe this one will take or like you know maybe they'll come. This year, uh, you know, it's just like this kind of like desire to like you know produce something that you know inevitably you know died the death it needed to die, but like hopefully it can be reborn. And it may take a few years for it to be reborn as well. Um, Ma'am, you had a question. Yeah. Over here, who has the mic? Now it's time to pass the mic. I'm curious about what you think about the role of the gallery going down the road. I mean, you have the fair to provide that commercial outlet, and more and more young people are interested in happenings, and more and more art is socially relevant or hybrids of music and dance and, and, and interactive when you spend all day you know, by yourself on the web and more and more, you know, and artists have their websites and so on and so on and so on. And, you know, the uh, museums have more performative components now as well. So what do you think is the role of the gallery going forward? Is there one? A, a commercial art gallery? Commercial art. Well, I mean, the, it's still where, you, how the artists make money, it's how, um, I mean, I'd say that's the number the number one thing. They don't make money from us at the museums. Um, we just <laughs> provide hopefully a more neutral place. But you for see it in, in brick and mortar. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Unless art becomes immaterial completely, which is never going to happen. In order to be at a fair, you actually, in most fairs, you have to have an actual physical gallery. You can't just be an independent uh, private dealer you know most most fairs are pretty strict on that uh, except there is a yeah. isn't there like a virtual fair now the yeah, the yeah, fair, 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 but it's yeah. it's so it's yeah but it's not really proving to be too no. successful yet but uh, you know i also i think to kind of turn the, the question around i think a lot there there's been such a groundswell of more performative uh works of art because i think artists are perhaps ex uh, you know and 
responding to this very market driven kind of moment that you know perhaps um, you know it's really in a weird way the market has actually kind of produced this kind of vogue for more performative works for works that are more immaterial that that do circumvent uh, a certain kind of commercial uh, structure although you know I don't know some artists like Tina Segal will Maybe find a way to sell it anyway yeah. so yeah. Um, but there's also more um, institutional response to performance yeah. art and with Performa, the biennial, at, you know, MoMA now has a, a, a department of performance art as well. I mean, so they're really, it's, our, our, our ideas as to how you can collect these types of things, like Marina Abramovic reproducing performances that she's done in the past, you know, th th we, we star are starting to think about these things in different ways, whereas yeah. it used to be that there was just the, the photographs or the film, just the ephemera of a performance that you collected. Now the idea that you could actually have like the, like for a Donald Judd uh, sculpture piece that you could have the instructions for it or like for a Sala Witt wall work that you could have the instructions for a performance piece and be able to recreate it. Yeah, and th those, I mean, that was, that's very much a, uh, you know, happening in, in institutions, but I think the role then of the, of the gallery, uh, you know, in the ideal, in an ideal world, as you know, kind of Mary suggested, you know, the galleries there, day in and day out, like they are working, you know, they're they're in constant conversation with their artists. They're talking to them on the phone every single day, checking in with them. They come to their studios. I mean, I was talking to a gallerist friend the other day who goes, she goes weekly to her artist studios and and you know, you know, kind of talks through what they're what they're working on. And it, it's a it's a you know, in the best case, the, the those relationships last for 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 very long time and that would be the first place you would go for information on what an artist you know was thinking or doing when that artist is no longer there you know a mm -hmm. gallerist who'd had a relationship with that artist for years and years and you know really serving as an archive for what artists uh, are doing because often artists are not able to archive their own practices in in an efficient or, or, or accessible way to others um, but that's then the role of the gallery is to really pay attention to you know every show that they've been in every work that has been in each show and you know documentation and you know just kind of as an archive as a physical archive of what the artist has been doing I think it's in, invaluable especially to, to what we do I mean we rely on that extensively but that doesn't necessarily require a space Oh sure, yes. yeah, it does. I mean, uh, ephemera. I mean, they have they have the announcements for every show that the right. artist has been. In. I mean, I'm thinking about you know artists who've been around for a long time or may may not again may not even be alive anymore. But that gallery then is is where you go to get you know the, the that kind of information if you you know research. It's research. Yeah, I've, yeah. I uh, did an interview with Arnie Glimpshire about 50 years of the gallery, and he said that what he'd learned from uh, Sidney Janis, which was a, a very big uh, gallery in New York was that Janice never kept any records uh, of all of this stuff, or Leo Castelli even. It's like there's no archive there. But Arnie did from the day one, and when they did their 50 year anniversary, they had just one section of the whole gallery was just ephemera, mm -hmm. invitations from, from shows, photographs from openings. You know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was amazing to, to see the times uh, recreated. And yesterday I had the uh, pleasure of spending like 30, uh, 40 minutes with uh, Richard Gray in his office, like talking about his collection that had been shown at the Art Institute of Chicago, going a uh, collection of drawings mainly from old master times to, to modernism, Picasso, and uh, it was amazing, you know, to hear his stories about each piece and, you know, the, uh, you know like where he found it, um, you know, uh, what it meant to him, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, galleries, you know, the, the galleries aren't going to go away. You know, and, and also too, I mean, institutions as collectors are, they collect objects, you know, and that's, that's what artists make in all forms. I mean, it, it's like uh, Bryce Wolkowitz has some incredible new media pieces in, in his booth that are things that, you know, when we look at them as, you know, as people that have been walking the aisles of fairs and, and looking at work in museums, it's, it can sometimes even be astonishing for us to see like something, uh, uh, an artwork that's moving in a way that uh, is just amazing. Uh, there's, uh, uh, I think, it's Sherry uh, Sherry Martin too. That they have these uh, uh, video pieces that I, I was just stopped in my tracks to see. It was like um, the it's the the drawing is being made as you look at it. You know. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, pass the mic back a row there to the. Oh. 
woman in the black and white thing. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, my question is more about um, y'all as curators. Um, because since there's three of y'all up there, I was just really curious. Um, so what are the boundaries you'll face as curators in a museum um, when it comes to exhibiting works of artists? Like um, back in the day when um, Peggy Guggenheim had to exhibit, like she had these drastic curated shows where you could touch the artwork and you know things like that. But like in today's museum world, like wh what, are your, what, what are your restrictions when it comes to representing the artists? I mean, are there any? I last year when I was here at the um, at the Museum of Contemporary Art, there was someone getting tattooed with a dot, I think, right? I mean, so I don't know. Are there boundaries? We have legal departments yeah. Yeah. now. <laughs> that I don't you have think to run the, things through. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't always the case. Um, so, yeah, you know, when, when we make decisions about what work we're going to show and how we're going to show it, there's, you know, extensive conversations with legal department about what the implications are for the visitors if there are any kind of safety issues or things like that we have to be really uh, vigilant about how how we exhibit work and the and you know considering that you know both for the protection of the work and for the protection of the viewers depending on what the work is um, you know that's a huge constraint um, but it's also important one that that we all you know have to very close attention to. What about um, the like? What about the artists themselves? Like, um, have you ever had an issue where an artist wasn't happy with the way their work was represented, or? Um Those are issues I think you try to work out in advance. Uh, could we take one last question, please? Anybody? Oh, over here. Yeah. Thank you. Given your time constraints at an art fair, um, how, how easy is it for you to really absorb video art, given that it's a time-based media? Mm. And that, mm -hmm. I imagine, must be incredibly difficult. Depends on the video. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I, all right, I, Michael will get this. Uh, you know, at, uh, what was it, Art Unlimited uh, in Basel, they had uh, Douglas Gordon and Philippe Parreno's uh, Zidane. Uh, which mm. follows a single mm -hmm. uh, soccer player for the duration of a 90-minute uh, soccer match, which those of you who know me knew that I was probably there for the full 90 minutes, <laughs> even though I'd already seen the piece over and over again. Um, you know, you make time, and you make time for things that, you know, really draw your interest and are visually resting. I think there was a Jordan Wolfson piece at one of the fairs recently that really kind of sucked me in, and you just, you know... But I think you could say the same thing for a great painting. You know, you just sort of sit there and, and, and bake on it for, that's the beauty of art. <laughs> but do you also, with, you know, in a situation like that, if you don't have the time to, to sit and, and really watch a time-based piece, I think, you know, 99% of the time the art, the dealer will, you know, provide, uh, you know, a viewing copy at some point for, you know, for, 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 you know, just contact them and, you know, we would get a viewing copy later to be able to spend more time with it because, you know, it's clear that in this context it's a very hard thing to do. But, you know, Dominic said, you, you know, you make time if you, if, if you, if you want to and it's, uh, you know, if it draws you in. But I also think there are times when I'll just take a quick look around and say, okay, you know, that looks interesting. I want to know more you know, and contact the gallery to, to get more information and have maybe a, a longer time with it. It gives you a good place to run and hide somewhere dark. and Exactly, well. like take a, look, take a little, you know, just kind of rest from the fluorescent lights. Well, thank you uh, to the panelists uh, for sharing their thoughts. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, um, audience, great questions. Thank you.